So the first part of the book, the first four chapters, is called Overview of Neurology. And so I'm going to do a short lecture on basically chapter one and chapter four, although I'm not going into too much detail on chapter four. Um, and chapter two is neuroanatomy, and this is not a neuroanatomy class, even though we will talk briefly about the neuroanatomy of each system we talk about. There is um, an assignment this week that is um, about brain and nervous system structure and function. You can use the information in chapter two to complete that assignment, even though there will not be a lecture on that assignment, and you will not be responsible for that information on the exam either. It's um, just an overview to get oriented, really. Um, and then chapter three is a um, short one about um, neurological examination and evaluation. Of course, you know, we do not do evaluation, but it is good for us to know um, what goes into that. And so I will have a brief lecture on that as well. So um, what is neuroscience? Um, our text says it's the quest to understand the nervous system. Totally makes sense, right? Uh, neuroscience is a relatively new study concerned with um, neural development, chemistry, structure, function, and the pathologic characteristics of the nervous system. So um, it involves chemistry. It involves um, psychology has gone to a neuroscience view, really. Um, and it involves rehabilitation, certainly. And so it's sort of where all of this intersects. So there are lots of different ways to look at the nervous system. Uh, molecular neuroscience investigates the chemistry and physics involved in neural functions. Of course, I love that. But um, we will talk a little bit about that. We're talking about neurotransmitters and um, how the um, neurons transmit information. Pretty important stuff. Um, some of the diseases that we deal with regularly in physical therapy, such as Parkinson's disease, um, involve the deficit of neurotransmitters. Um, what last quarter when we talked about mental disorders, um, a lot of them are neurochemical disorders. So that is very uh, much at the heart of uh, molecular and cellular neuroscience. So cellular neuroscience considers the distinction among different types of cells in the nervous system and how each cell type functions. So um, we will be talking about that as well, the different cells in the nervous system, how they work together, um, or what we know about how they work together, because there's a lot of things in the nervous system that are still mysterious, which is one of the things that makes it interesting. Um, systems neuroscience investigates groups of neurons that perform a common function together. So um, after the introductory part of the book and the cellular part, we are largely going to be concerning ourselves with systems neuroscience. Um, the bulk of this course, the last two-thirds of it anyway, we'll be talking about different systems and how the neurons perform together to do their common functions, and the, the pathologies that are involved when they don't do that right, and what kind of things we see in rehabilitation. Um, behavioral neuroscience, a very interesting area. However, we will not be going into it in great depth. Um, that would be your psychology course that you took. Um, however, working in rehabilitation, of course, we're working with human beings, and behavior is a huge part of it. So cognitive neuroscience covers fields of thinking, learning, and memory. And while we won't be um, delving into it in a um, very in-depth way, we will talk a little bit about um, thinking, learning, and memory because physical therapy is of its essence a teaching profession. So we need to know how people learn, how do we motivate people, um, how people remember things, and when they have disorders that affects their memory, how do we work around that? Or how do we compensate for that? So um, the kind of things that neuroscience answers are, how do ions influence nerve cell function? So we talked in um, pathophysiology about um, electrolyte balance and um, fluid balance. So now we're, how does that affect nerve cell function? Um, how is language formed and understood? Um, I'm lucky I work in a multidisciplinary clinic and I get to work with um, 
as well as uh, PTs, I get to work with OTs and speech language pathologists, so I get a little insight into um, what they do um, with people in rehabilitation. And also a lot of times they um, enlighten me about um, other ways I can help my patients. Um, so we really want to know how can physical therapy and occupational therapy and speech therapy assist a patient in regaining maximum independence after a neurologic injury. So this book is organized. Um, the first section, the first four chapters, is a neurology overview. The next four chapters, we look at things, or the next two chapters, sorry, we look at things on the cellular level. This is a picture of, or a diagram of a nerve cell. Um, the next two chapters, we talk about the development of the nervous system and neuroplasticity and learning, very interesting area. After that, we go into vertical systems. So um, the peripheral nervous system is largely composed of vertical systems, so we will talk about that. And then the last part, we will talk about different regions of the nervous system. So this is sort of where we're headed um, to the cerebral cortex. So the vertical systems include the autonomic nervous system, the um, somatosensory system, and the motor system. Um, then the regions of the nervous system, we're going to talk about the peripheral region, the spinal region, the um, brainstem and cerebellar regions, and then finally the cerebral cortex. So when we get to the cerebral cortex at the end of the quarter, um, this is sort of what all the pieces that are going to go into the sensations we detect and the motor acts that we do to respond to them. So we get information from the somatosensory system that goes to the primary sensory cortex and the secondary sensory cortex. All that information is processed and um, interpreted in the association cortex, which is a large part of our brain. Um, then if, if there's a motor act that needs to happen, it needs to go to motor planning areas and then finally to the primary motor cortex to have that motor output that's going to um, guide our actions. So um, I don't remember, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but when I was a kid I remember hearing, oh, we only use 5% of our brain or some small percentage, which is absolutely not true. Um, the a large percentage of our brain is involved in association cortex. Um, so goal setting, planning, monitoring, interpretation of sensation, emotions, and memory processing. So all of this stuff goes into interpreting sensory information, planning motor information. So throughout the quarter I'm going to go back to this diagram and we're going to talk about where we are in this diagram. So um, there are clinical cases that are embedded in most of the chapters of this book. Um, diagnostic clinical reasoning is, a, um, is largely pattern recognition, or that's the key component. So you can say, how does this look like what I think it's supposed to look like, and how doesn't it look like that? What patterns am I seeing? So there are um, clinical diagnostic clinical reasoning questions at the end of the chapter. Of course, as PTAs, we don't do diagnosis, but doing that, those clinical reasoning questions helps us integrate this information and figure out what's really going on. So chapters, chapter two is a review of neuroanatomy. You're not going to be responsible for that depth of information, but I want you to use that um, information in chapter two, and there's a PowerPoint that goes with it. I want you to use it to um, complete the um, homework assignment for this week. And then chapter three, the, I'll have a short lecture that goes with that about um, uh, neurological examination and evaluation. Chapter four is about neuroimaging, and there are lots of amazing pictures in there. Um, we don't really need to know all that much about um, neuroimaging, except it's a relatively recent advancement. Um, there is information that we can get from neuroimaging that we've never had access to before. Um, the way they used to tell how a whether a certain area of the brain was involved in um, any kind of activity was if somebody was injured in that area of the brain and they couldn't do that activity. Well now they can do functional MRI studies and see what area of the brain lights up when we're in pain, what area of the brain lights up when we're um, 
happy, you know, so or what area of the brain lights up when we're doing a motor task. So neuroimaging kind of gives us some um, information that we never had before. So um, most neuroimaging is viewed on one of three planes, um, the sagittal, the coronal, or the vertical plane. And um, there's a little bit about that in um, chapter two. Um, both uh, CT scan and MRI technologies allow us to visualize the brain um, in a static way, but very detailed. Um, there are lots of different imaging technologies. Um, they're described in the book and in the PowerPoint. I don't expect you to know every one of them. But I also want you to be aware that neuroimaging is not the be-all and end-all of everything. So I, I titled this slide, Don't Be a Vomit, and this is based on some of the um, explain pain work done by um, David Butler and his associates. Um, the idea is that you're, you shouldn't panic if you have a spine CT scan or MRI that shows problems with your discs. Um, disc degeneration, bulges, or tears can all be normal changes. We probably all have them. Um, various studies of upper and lower backs in people without pain, this is people without pain, 47% um, of adults age 50 to 55 have disc degeneration. Um, or, I'm sorry, 47% of adults in total, age 50 to 55, 90% of us have disc degeneration. Age 20 to 22, 48%. So um, you can have disc degeneration without pain. 22% um, uh, or 53% uh, of adults have disc bulges. Aged uh, 20 to 22, 25% of them have disc bulges. 58% um, of adults have disc tears. 29% even had a disc bulge that was deforming their spinal cord without having symptoms. So there's no link between degenerative changes seen on imaging and low back pain. So don't blame your neck and back pain on disc degeneration and bulges. I can't tell you how many times in the clinic I run across people who live and die by their um, MRI or their CT scan um, and they they convince themselves that they should be in pain because they have all these things wrong but um, really that is just one piece of the picture we will talk about pain when we're talking about vertical systems and um, we'll see that pain is a very complex subject it doesn't necessarily follow that pain equals tissue damage so um, don't be a vomit um, be aware that you can have um, pain without damage, you can have damage without pain, and you can have damage and pain together. So even though neuroimaging is great, it is not the be-all and end-all of everything. So um, neuroimaging allows us an understanding of neuroanatomy that was previously unavailable, and it's increasingly being used to uh, demonstrate the efficacy of neurorehabilitation. In um, some of the chapters of the book, it, we'll talk about imaging studies that were done and um, what we learned from them. So you can actually see changes um, in both functional MRIs and other types of scans following occupational or physical therapy in people with CP, fibromyalgia, and stroke. And um, knowledge of what neuroimaging is out there can be um, vital in individualizing treatment plans and optimizing therapy regimens. So um, imaging is important, but it's not the only thing. That's the message I want you to get on this.